Dr. Malawana is a former obstetric registrar and chair of junior doctors committee of the BMA from September 2015-2016. And he's currently founder and director of the Leadership Academy and also co-founder and CEO of Voculus Medics Academy. So we're absolutely delighted that he's been able to come at very short notice um, to uh, tell us about more about how we can use our time. So thank you very much. Um, firstly, uh, I apologize as I put this together kind of last night and overnight. So, uh, and I'm not actually very good with PowerPoint. I normally just talk. So I, I hope that this works. Okay, so time is a precious thing. We all know this. Um, and it's especially true in healthcare. Um, I'm someone who is rather idealistic and I also tend to want to solve problems. So I knew that how we train healthcare professionals um, is not just, uh, not just in this country, but all over the world, means that we lose so much effort and amazing content through our poor or even non-existent use of technology. What I'll tell you today is a little introduction to Ebola, show you some of the things that we thought we knew that turned out to be wrong and some of the novel challenges that we faced why it spread, and maybe how we could have thought that we could have prevented it. So what I'm going to show you is something you will think, once you see it, is very, very simple. Um, it's very obvious, um, and frankly, everyone that sees it usually says, why has this not done, been done before? So. I'll give you a bit of background as to who I am. Some of you probably know this. Uh, I was, uh, um, I had 17 years of, uh, in, um, kind of in various medical leadership kind of roles. Um, and a couple of years ago, I led a very fractious conversation with the government. Um, I can tell you about that, but it will uh, it'll probably be a different story. Um, so some of my background um, was, uh, my background is mainly in medical education and leadership roles. Um, uh, I'll give you a very brief overview um, just to set the context of how I know we need to solve this problem. Um, and I'm going to hopefully show you the solution too, which is a very simple solution um, to how do we save time. I was quite an active student. Um, I always wanted to find ways of minimizing the time I spent studying. Um, not studying is the, usually the way. And I spent, um, and I took on leadership roles from a very early stage in my career. Um, in a host of organizations. Um, I negotiated various aspects of the learning environment for doctors, um, including being responsible following the MTAS crisis in 2007, following, just to be clear, uh, the negotiating components of the system. Um, I was responsible for writing and negotiating the original in the first interdisciplinary transfer system in the UK, um, which use, is used by many doctors still to transfer between um, in their jobs. And I did that in 2008, and we implemented it pretty much within eight or nine months. Um, between 2009 and 2012, I sat on the board of the General Medical Council and the Postgraduate Medical Education Training Board. I was only one of two people on both boards, and I oversaw the merger of the two organizations, um, along with my, with my colleague that was also on it. And during this time, I was an NHS obstetrics trainee delivering babies in London. Um, and during that period, as you can imagine in the NHS, or even, you know, we know that as we go through our training, it is extremely, our time in the NHS is extremely precious. Um, and some would argue it's not very well utilized. So what did I see as a doctor? Well, healthcare training is extremely expensive. It is difficult to access, um, and, but it is a requirement to practice. Um, and at all levels, it was, there was one simple, fact, which is healthcare demand just keeps going up, no matter what. Um, the answer from politicians and even from within our profession is simply to train more, train more, train more doctors, train more nurses, train more healthcare professionals. However, if it takes 10 years to train a GP from scratch, it takes over 20 to 30 years to train someone effectively to train those GPs. And that's a fundamental problem that has that you know we can't get away from. So we decided to do something about this bottom line, which is to try and solve the underlying problem that we saw, which was a not a simplistic answer of just training more people, 
but how we train them and how we do it more efficiently and create more time in the system. So the world is an increasingly small place. Um, if you are an amazing educator, you want to we want, what you'd need to learn is how to disseminate that knowledge across the world efficiently and spread that skill as far and as wide as possible. So how do you do that without losing the enthusiasm to deliver or actually make, make it as efficient as possible? Building on what, we've, what, has already, what that educator has already done, but not making them spend hours on a plane flying from place to place to place, which is often the, um, the solution that many institutions try and do. They try and offload campuses all over the world, or they do various other things. But it's simply repeating the same problem. It's a very inefficient way of doing this. So my team and I built this, Medics Academy. Um, we hope this is um, our version of a time machine. We create more time in the system so we can deliver better quality of education, more efficiently and at scale across the globe. Education technology is simply one of the most important developments of the next decade. But healthcare sits probably 15 years ago in its use of technology in this industry. So we've built, hopefully, a system that's suitable for the next decade. Here's the problem as described by a midwife. We started with an area I knew the NHS struggled to deliver, as often allied health professionals are an afterthought in healthcare innovations. But if you can deliver quality to a greater number, you raise the standards across the board. Also being an obstetrician, I learned during my career that it always pays off to be nice to the midwives. Um, it's worth your existence. I don't enjoy what I've done previously. I find it quite boring. There's a lot of just kind of slideshows, like PowerPoint, you just have to keep clicking through and it gets quite boring. So a very complicated tech build is just part of the problem. Cloud-based platforms, content delivery networks, payment and membership integrations, load ba balancing systems are all vital. Um, and that's what the underlying architecture of the technology we have built is. But as you heard from that midwife, you have to do something that is engaging. So why would anyone waste their time on what you have to tell them if you don't make it something they want to hear? So we had to build whole processes around library conversions taking libraries of content and learning how to convert them extremely efficiently so that you can deliver content at scale. That is vital if you're going to create this concept of time within the system. So let's take you through some stories. I use stories as a medium to demonstrate concepts. I quite like telling stories. So um, let's, take, let's take this Aspie conference. I hope this doesn't go down badly. Um, so there are many amazing speakers um, and knowledge. And but is it efficiently delivered? How many of the topics are ones that we've discussed before? How many times does your organization use gatherings as a way of delivering training? How do they deliver it time and again? How much of that training is complex? How much of it is didactic? How much is consistent when explaining complex concepts? In sta in, and how much do you have to do it when standing in front of someone and just explaining it? How well do they take that in? If it's better written down, how many of you have been to an event or a conference or a meeting and haven't done the pre-reading? Hi, and welcome to the Street Doctor's Bleeding Module. To be able to teach young people how to save lives. So Street Doctors is a fantastic charity um, that trains medical students and junior doctor volunteers on how to engage with young people, how to stop gang violence, and learn how to perform first aid on a person. That is the subject of violent trauma. So, for instance, people that have been stabbed in uh, gang fights, etc., etc. They spend a huge amount of the t their time, so they run a conference every year, and they spend a huge amount of that time during that conference training up their volunteers in how to actually run their, their, their 
train the trainer session, how to stop people, A, engaging with violence, and then, more importantly, what are the life-saving techniques that you can teach a young person to actually try and save a life on, um, on the ground. So we looked at this conference, just as a, because we uh, believe in this, um, in this charity. So we looked at their conference and we basically tried to work out how to make it so much more efficient for them. So what we did was we built their training modules around what they would do normally. And we engaged with, made them as engaging as possible so that therefore people would engage with the training modules before they get, got to the conference. And about 60, 70% of their physical location time, co-location time where the conference delegates were there, was used, uh, was used for this, these training modules. So imagine your simulation centers, how much of that, that didactic part of the training actually needs to be done in a very expensive simulation center. So we could also check, the, the whole point of these systems is you can check in real time what someone is doing. And so we could keep track as, the pe as people were doing, doing, undertaking their training, and we could see were, these, were people that were coming up to the conference actually doing what they were meant to do? Could we feed back to them and, and remind them? Could we get other people involved to say, please, will you get on and do your pre-reading? So you kind of become a schoolmaster for them. So example two. Here we worked with World Extreme Medicine. I don't know whether any of you know the organization, but they do amazing trauma um, training all over the world. Um, they, do some, uh, they do a lot of pre-hospital care, um, and they use uh, a really interesting content base as a, as a, for what they do. Their user base is spread over five continents. It's over 100,000 people. So how can you efficiently tr provide training to them and make it as engaging as possible? My name is Owen Walker and I just want to take you on a journey through trauma care and also walk you through my experience. Our aim was to find a solution that saved a huge amount of time and could create a sustainable content library that can be accessed and used time and again. So for street doctors, when we go back to that example, now that their training modules have been built, every single conference going forward they are able to save that time on a compound basis. efficiencies in the system, you can invest further and even better content that helps deliver better education. So you also engage the learner, and in this case, health professionals most are, which is, who are our most precious resource. It, um, you can train them in a way that really engages, with, engages them and really encourages them to get involved in what, they're, in, in what you're delivering to them. It is therefore extremely important that you use their time efficiently. The complaints I hear from doctors across the board, but not just doctors, all health professionals, is how much their employers and, all, um, and everyone else tends to use their time extremely inefficiently. So if you can use their time efficiently, they definitely engage with the system. In this next example, I want to show you how this is done. Uh, do, you don't need to be even a huge organization. You don't actually need to be a large organization to do this. You don't need a lot of uh, investment. But you can access the technology. If you can make this technology and platform generally available, which we have, um, you can make it 
much more accessible for the best educators in the world to get their content out to a global audience, which is an incredibly useful and powerful thing. We just need to give those educators the channel to be able to do that. My name is Mr. Dancelo Jeme. I have been running this uh, London Perini Surgical Skills Workshop for the past 13, 14 odd years. We shall be looking at the Perini repair itself. <music> Who are the professionals that will come in contact with uh, women mostly and will need to conduct this repair? They are the midwives. So why is this important? Well, in this particular example, this course takes a whole day. They, um, they take up a huge resource base because they uh, have to spend money on a wet lab in order to deliver this content. And yet, when you look at the, the, uh, the actual course itself, in this case, it was about 70 to 80 percent of the course was effectively the transmission of information, just didactic um, transmission of information. So what happens if you take that content into pre-learning? Well, if you take that content into pre-learning, what happens when you, when you can actually you know, keep checks on whether people are doing them is that suddenly you have a lot more time in an extremely expensive resource. And you can either get more people through or you could spend more time with them doing something that's actually quite a lot more complicated and it's harder to do via kind of um, written work or video or whatever. Um, so the ability to explain complex ideas, you saw the, the way that you can see the surgeon's point of view. You can actually see where the suture's put in. No matter, I've been on these courses before, right? You, you, there's 20 of you in a room, I'm sure the, doctor, the junior doctors in here kind of hear this, but you, you stand in a room, it depends where you're sitting, it depends where you're looking from, where you, what, what you see, right? And if, you, if one of the key aspects of a perineal repair is knowing where to put that first apex suture in, exactly where to put it in, because it's so vital you get that first suture in the right place. So if you can't see, you're not in standing in the right place, it's inconsistent in its delivery, you lose this huge important aspect. And that's just you know, a microsecond of an entire day course. Consultant, obstetrician, and gynecologist. So suddenly, using um, the ability to transmit complex ideas and um, demonstrate anatomy, show and, and blend every all the components in together, makes it extremely easy to to get these complex ideas across to the learner. <coughs> so. That's the majority of my talk. I'm going to do one quick, I'm gonna, since I've got the microphone, I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, so um, we've got a conference at the, the Leadership Academy, the Healthcare Leadership Academy on the 19th of December in Amnesty International. Um, if you, uh, it's, uh, we talk a lot about, in what we do, technology um, and uh, uh, how you innovate in the healthcare system, how you create um, amazing systems that talk to each other. And it's not just the UK, we have speakers coming from all over, the, all over Europe, we have people involved. So if you um, are uh, free around Christmas time and you want to come and see something really cool, um, then do come along.
just as a, I, I completely abused the, the opportunity to come up here to plug that. Uh, but basically, we have, um, what we do is we take uh, young uh, uh, doctors, midwives, uh, um, healthcare professionals and students from across Europe, um, well, in mostly from the UK, but increasingly from Europe, to take them through an extremely interesting um, leadership program that kind of um, exposes the, them to very, we like, interesting ideas and uh, people, philosophers, artists, um, uh, leaders in healthcare, leaders in business uh, um, from across the board. Um, it's a really good way of increasing the ability and the kind of skill set of some very young people at the early stage of their career. Um, so I hope you do, um, you, if you are interested, do come and um, get involved or find me or whatever. Um, so I'm on, this is, um, so I'm just going to th wrap up and say that I think the one thing that I've, learnt over my um, looking around slightly shorter career than some of the other people in the room, uh, is that you, um, you, that if you don't um, basically t uh, t value how you deliver things to people and you waste their time, what happens is they then, um, they don't take it seriously or they, they switch off and you lose that, um, that concentration. So if you can make the system more efficient, you can deliver the bits you have to deliver using a method or a technology or something else that actually is suited to what you're trying to deliver and not just w use one technique for thinking that one technique is the solution to all your problems, then actually you're much more likely to make a system that the way you engage with those people and engage them in terms of creating messages and getting them to understand things far more effective. So I would... Uh, if you do need anything to, um, you, my contact details are on the on there. Um, but thank you very much, and uh, I'm sorry we've put it together very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Right. Hi. Um, those um, e-learning modules look um, amazing, but do you find you have any opposition? Because if somebody goes to a course and you're saying that that content can be, can be delivered before the, the course, it's kind of pre-reading, if they go to the course, they can do that, and that's the study leave. But if they happen to do the pre-reading, they don't get study leave for that, do they? That's kind of in their own time or in work time. If it's in work time, it's in work time. Um, it's ultimately you... I mean, how you how you actually deliver this is a is a is always an is an issue with any of this stuff because um, increasingly the question over whether you should take uh, content online is is a bit is a bit in, um, uh, if that's the if that's the if that's the argument the ship has kind of sailed on that one right so because you using time efficiently imagine just the travel time to get to a course or if you save the, the transport cost so if you if you're even if your agenda is a green agenda imagine not spending the the uh, the you know the the fossil fuels to move people around uh, a, a geography the fact is that using it, um, you a conversation with your with the employers is vital, but if you save efficient, if you're sufficiently fa saving enough time in the system that you don't have to have those arguments, which is a tough one, I know from the arguments we've had. Um, but you can. You the, the point is, you want to try and engage them as much as possible. The fact is that some of these courses, what we did was we were able to concertina them right down. So almost a day, a half a day to three quarters of a day of content we could concertina down to less than an hour and a half because actually the underlying content that, you, <coughs> that you're trying to transmit is relatively condensed. If you imagine just the getting everyone to sit down, lunch, all that stuff that you cut out, it's very, very concentrated. What you also have to do is um, make it really accessible. So if it's, for instance... In the, um, you can only log in to a hospital computer which doesn't really work very well and doesn't... Stri what we've essentially done is built an entire architecture around the idea that you carry the solution in your pocket. So you can deliver this onto a phone. And... Yeah, 
The system accredits you for time because it accredits your CPD and there's this whole system behind it that lets you do that. And the other thing about this system is that actually you can't get around it, right? So it measures down to the nanosecond your engagement with the system. So if it's a question, in fact, it, get, it measures it even further than that. But we, if, so this is why that, that chart showing how much of the engagement had been done. If you watch a video only, you can't actually, the way it's structured, you can't actually just press play and leave. So. Um, you, it's structured in such a way. So, I mean, I'm a, doc, I, I'm a junior doctor, right? I know every trick there is to, <laughs> to work out how to get around having to do this stuff, right? So you can't do certain things that I know I would do if it was up to me. So you have to kind of engage with the system in a certain way, and you can't just do that. So that means that, and then it measures everything. So if you are, um, if you have done half of one bit and not the other, it'll, it'll track that in real time. So, but that's important for, not just for tracking you, but it's actually important for your ability. So I've seen it so many times. Most people are extremely honest, right? And their honesty is questioned rather than them actually doing so. So if you can produce reports that say, actually, here, here you go. This is how much time it took me to engage in this system. But I was able to do it on my tube journey from home to the hospital. Or I was able to do it sitting on my sofa rather than Actually, but you're still, you're still doing your learning, right? That's the point. That's what you're being paid to do. Okay, thank you. There's another question up at the top there. I think um, hi, thank you for that. For I, um, I'm one of the older members of the audience you were referring to earlier on. Um, I'm getting I, there myself, so don't worry about <laughs> it. <coughs> and I, I very enjo much enjoyed your talk, and I completely agree with, with what you're talking about. I think the last point was very important, however. Uh, in that when you do get to the education, there's so many times in a simulation situation that you don't really feel you have enough time. And saving the time by doing the work online is very important. But what the, the comment, the last question uh, brought up is this bit about employers not recognizing the time. And I just wanted to make the point that I felt that ASPE as a national organization in, in this is probably something we should be picking up on to try and influence the employers more because I agree with everything you said. It's time saving, it's, it's much more better use of the simulation time, etc. But the employers at the minute are not doing it. And I think it's a point that ASPE should pick up on. The, I'd say that, and, and it's just repeating, I suppose it's repeating, but, but if you have the data, so we, that's the one thing we built into this, knowing what we're like. We built in the d data capture that allows you to prove. There's no question over what, how much time it took you to do something because it's already there. It's logged. It cannot be, you know, you can't, it's not... It's not monitoring. You can't kind of like change it, yeah, or, like, or someone else can't change it. The system logs everything, right? And so actually, it produces a report, and it's very clear. So no one can argue it wasn't done or it was done in a, and yeah. So it, it, it's important. I think often in these conversations, it's important to to get rid of the reasons why someone would argue the converse, and that's what we try to do because actually, we know how they argue the converse. So we made sure that was built in. Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but I think um, you will be able to uh, ask them during uh, the coffee break later. So, thank you very much. Have a thank you present.